first question this morning is Senator Mac McSherry. Senator, you have 15 minutes. Thanks very much, Chairman, and thanks, um, Mr. Brown, for, for, for coming in. Uh, can I talk first about your time with the Irish Times? Um, what, what did you write about? What were the, the themes and, and areas that you wrote about while you were there? How much time do we have? <laughs> I, I covered oh, an awful lot of uh, areas in the Irish Times. I uh, was a, an editor in the education section for the a large section of my time there. I worked in the newsroom as uh, doing general reporting for a time as well. I did a lot of feature writing, a lot of arts coverage, uh, reviewed film and theater books. Uh, I had a column for many years about radio. I was the radio critic for the Irish Times, and uh, I edited also a, a media studies page aimed at uh, secondary school students uh, in the in the paper. Did you ever experience editorial interference? Oh, of course, and that's uh, you know that that is the that is part of the structure of, of any news organization or of any indeed of any organization. When you say editorial interference, that is that means. Did anybody in a position of power in the organization ever suggest that I should or shouldn't do something in a certain way? Yes, of course. I mean, that, that is, apart, that is from, apart from guidance and mentoring, as I'm sure any boss would provide, yeah. was there ever a line you were taking that you were advised to adjust for any reasons that were unusual? Well, I, 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 an interesting example, perhaps, because it touches a little bit on the ownership question in a slightly askew way. We've already said that the Irish Times is owned by a trust, but the major rival to the Irish Times owned by a large organization. Uh, and um, on the media studies page that I mentioned that I, I was editing, uh, we did a, a full page sort of exploration for, as I said, for, for young people of the issue of media ownership with a very large photograph of the proprietor of the organization in question, the, the, uh, the rival organization to the Irish Times. I'm being very careful here. Um, the, um, um, one of the Irish Times editors came down to me the following week after that, uh, that particular page had come under some attack in the rival publication for some of its statements and said, maybe it's a good idea not to pick a fight with, uh, with that particular organization and to do it in that particular way. Let's, uh, when you're doing, you know, carry on, uh, but let's just not go there in terms of like raising okay. questions about the ownership of a rival organization. Okay, S specifically, did you ever have any um, experience of uh, what we might call corporate interference where a particular line was, um, uh, uh, I suppose, adverse to advertisers. Was there any kind of interference like that where, where an editor said, look, could you be more commercially sensitive or, you know, that? No, no, I can't say that I did. I was, uh, I was editor of a supplement uh, called Education and Living. And uh, there was, uh, the, the purpose of that supplement was to cover the education sector. There was a long-term hope within the paper that it would attract advertising, that it would, particularly recruitment advertising for the education sector. And there were occasionally discussions about can we find ways to do stories that are going to make the supplement more of a, a fit for the needs of these people so that they, they will understand that it's all well and good to advertise on a Friday in the business section, but they should also be advertising on a Tuesday in the education section. So certainly the, it, the, 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 the myth of the very firm wall between editorial and advertising that nobody from one side ever looks into the other side uh, is, is just that, it's a myth. Certainly the discussions took place, but I can't say that it, uh, it ever impinged very directly on my practice, except for the example that I gave. Yeah, but uh, apart from your own personal writings or whatever, yeah. I mean, would you have been aware in your time at the Irish Times, or indeed since, in your, in your, in your research, uh, of any situation where uh, there was a threat to withdraw advertising or indeed that there was a threat carried out in withdrawing advertising because of an editorial line being pursued by? There was uh, a case, and again, I'm going to be careful in discussing sure. this, but one that I'm very familiar with and I've, that, that I have reported on in, in the time since I left the Irish Times, where, where a senior uh, journalist within a newspaper that no longer exists was uh, relieved of his position after a piece ran under his jurisdiction that was uh, lightly mocking of a prominent property advertiser. That advertiser um, approached the managing director of this newspaper directly and the, uh, um, the consequence within 24 hours was the termination of the employment of this particular journalist. So it's, um, the examples of this are not Copious. I think for the reasons that were discussed in the earlier session, journalists usually understand the lines 
uh, that they yeah. need to be careful about crossing. But, but certainly, that is a very that's a that's a very good example of someone who crossed a line and, and paid with his job. Certainly, a very uh, a, a very relevant one. Uh, we can't mention names or organisations, of course. But can you say did that happen in the era that we're looking at? Yes, in it terms did. of the property. Yes, it did. Bust? It happened. It did. It happened um, in in. Uh, late in the era that we're talking about, as there were beginning to be questions raised about the, uh, about the bubble. Okay, that's very good. Um, can I ask, um, no, I won't be allowed to ask that, so I better, <laughs> I better move you off better that researcher. one. better yeah. researcher. <laughs> yeah. Um, the chairman mentioned some of the oversight and, and uh, of, of uh, the press council and, and codes of conduct. I mean, you know, in, in practice, I, I, are they sufficient or insufficient in, in your view? I have to say, um, I have myself been a complainant in relation to uh, using the code of practice, so I feel that I, my view might be prejudiced in that respect, Senator, and I would prefer not to enter into okay, a direct that's commentary fine. on that. Uh, is there a, 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 as part of the codes of conduct that exist and, and the, the between the NUJ and then I think papers such as the Irish Times have their own specific one internally as well. Yes. Do they govern things like gifts or um, junkets, issues like that? That's a very good question and at, at times they have and at times those sort of guidelines tend to fade. Certainly for most of the time that I was in the Irish Times we had a very active ethics committee within the paper uh, comprising staff from the, uh, from the newspaper, uh, editorial staff. And uh, there was a close eye kept on who was paying for trips and who was paying for lunch. And there was a strong feeling that journalists should pay their own way or they should not take part in uh, certain kinds of activities with potential sources and potential subjects of stories at all. Um, and I know that some, some newspapers continue to, to try to hold the line on that sort of activity. To be honest, uh, the, the overwhelming practice, I think, in the industry is fairly lax in that respect. Whether or not there are written codes in place that suggest it, and I must say the, the, uh, the, code of, uh, the code of practice of the Press Council of Ireland does not make specific reference okay. to that sort of uh, Would you have been aware, again, and we can't mention names or, or, or organizations uh, in your own career of, of, you know, the bestowing of a gift or tickets for the Champions League? Oh, or, of course, yeah, of course, so uh, absolutely, repeatedly. And, you know, there, there, there were examples uh, from quite early on in, in my career in relation to property interests specifically uh, that, that, you know, were dealt with within the organization in question. Pro property interests? I mean, giving property, or, or do you mean? I, I would prefer not to even go as specific uh, as that, Senator. Okay. But yes, where there was a, where there was a, uh, a a gift that raised questions uh, within the organization, and there were there were steps taken to uh, to address it. So, I mean, yeah, it, no, just, it certainly wasn't the case that there was a sort of a freewheeling culture of. Yeah, no, just just on that because I, I don't want to misunderstand you. I, I know we can't talk about names, and I'm, I, I won't, Chairman. But uh, are you saying that property was given to somebody? In effect. All right, and we're not talking tickets to a match now, we're talking bricks and mortar here, are we? In effect, yes. Okay, and in, in your experience, um, was there a direct correlation between that instance and maybe positive writings? Um, it will be into very specific or, or, or not, or, yeah, yeah. as the case no, 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 may be, or not. You, you could be talking very adversely there, no, that may be Yeah, no, I would prefer, I would prefer not to make, a, to make a statement along those lines, Senator. I think, I think that it's fair to say, you know, in general, that while you know the vast majority of journalists working in the property area uh, would not be engaged in anything remotely of resembling course. corrupt practices, um, that the 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 relationship between property developers, estate agents, etc., and the journalists working in those areas are such that conflict doesn't generally arise a great deal between them. There's a you know that there's, there's not really any need for gifts or or, or the showering of you know that there's a, there's a shared interest in property journalism uh, as traditionally understood and property supplements, a shared interest in the promotion of property sales. I, I think that property journalism in some respects gets, uh, gets a little bit of a hard, uh, you know, gets bashed a little too hard sometimes in these discussions. It is a kind of a genre unto itself. It, it features some of the most beautiful writing in some ways in journalism and I think most readers understand what property journalism is and, uh, and can see it 
uh, for what it is. My concern really about property supplements is not so much the journalism that was in them uh, so much or the relationships that existed between individual journalists and the interests that are represented there, but the insidious effect that their, their very existence had on larger uh, aspects of, the, of newspapers. So for, that ex for example, it's one thing to have the property supplement saying you should buy this beautiful home in Balls Bridge. It's another thing to have you know, the business advice column treating homes, treating houses as just another asset class that people are invited to invest in. Yeah. I think that in some ways that that's, that's more insidious. Yeah, just again, uh, Chairman, you correct me now if I'm, if I'm, if I'm veering off here, but uh, this is my last question. I won't need the additional time. Um, in your experience, is there a demonstrable correlation, uh, and there are, are there instances of this, between positive writings and the bestowing of gifts? It's a... Um it's a, it's a kind of a virtuous circle, I would say, Senator, that in the, in the fields like fashion, like property, uh, certain aspects of, of uh, business coverage where there's a kind of a routine low level bestowal of gifts. But I mean, there's a, there's a famous quote about journalism that I can never remember precisely, but it's, it's in effect, why would, you, uh, why would you bother bribing a journalist when you see how easy it is to get them to write exactly what you want for free? And I think that uh, you know that 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 characterizes the relationship between business interests and uh, and journalists much more clearly for me than the uh, than any notion that there's a kind of a, a, a sort of a corruption even at a even at a low level. But there were instances, you think? Oh yeah, but but, but as I'm saying, the correlation is is a sort of a virtuous circle that the, the journalists who are known to write nice things were invited along, and they might be given a, you know a, a sample product or they might be given a nice lunch or whatever, you know, that there was a, you know, you didn't have to be doing the journalism as a direct response to this lovely, uh, you know, uh, dessert that you got and the delicious wine that accompanied it. You, you did the story because you, but you might have been getting the dessert wine because of the, uh, because of the lovely coverage you've been given today. Um, just finally then, um, in terms of supplements in newspapers and we have a property, you yourself said you, you, you edited an education supplement. Um, has it become the practice, uh, and is this a new phenomenon, that supplements are about uh, telling the story of the commercial interest relevant to that, or uh, is, it, is it a critique? So is it a cut and paste uh, thing from the brochures of the corporates uh, representing those sectors, or, or, or is it uh, uh, you know, a, a, an investigative critique, you know, go to College A instead of College B because, buy a House A instead of House B because, as perhaps it should be. Has it become, do you feel or not, a scenario where it's cutting and pasting more from the brochures of the corporate world rather than the kind of professionalism and journalism that you referred to earlier? You know, it, it, it would be, uh, you know, generalizations are, are always dangerous, but I think uh, and certainly, if you pick up a, a business supplement of an Irish newspaper, you will find interesting, critical analysis of, of uh, the activities of, of business people within a certain critical framework that is what I would describe as a narrow ideological one in the sense that we were discussing earlier with Dr. Mersill, but that the, uh, there, is, there is real critical journalism in business supplements, in an education supplement, certainly. Okay, we so didn't we have a client base in the same way that it is. be a final question. Yeah, yeah it is, yeah. So just, um, just to stay with the educational exam. Sure, yeah. If College A had a full page ad and College B had an eighth of a page, would the editorial... I must say that the uh, reflect we, we, that these days we these we, days. we never had that worry terribly much in our education supplement of sure, colleges yeah, taking but a full page out. But, but uh, no, I think it would be fair to say that uh, that journalists would be certainly outside of the very explicit supplements like special reports and property 
that are actually designed to be ad magnets. And, you know, and sometimes the distinction can be a little unclear. I mean, I picked up the Sunday Business Post the other day. It's a wonderful newspaper, but as you, as you flip through it, there's certain pages that say focus on this or that, and you can see that they've essentially been designed as ad bait. When, when you see something like that, you say, well, you know, that, that there, is a, there is an element of a pretty direct correlation between the advertising and the editorial here. On the other hand, and, and, you know, I think that by and large, in a, in a, in, for instance, in a business supplement in, a, in the Irish Independent or the Irish Times, I don't think that the journalists are looking down to the bottom of the page to see who made the larger ad in order to determine who gets the better coverage. Okay, thank you. Just for Thanks. 